Welcome everyone. My name is Jim DeWald and I'm the Dean of the Haskine School of Business. As we broadcast from Calgary, I'd like to first take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. Now this includes the Sitsika, the Pakani, the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. Calgary, the city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Welcome to everyone. I don't know where you are, but it is likely if you're in Canada, it's snowing where you are. And no, it's not December. This is April 19th, and you're in for a very special treat. You'll be very happy that you tuned in on this. Um, by the way, wherever you are in Canada, wherever you are in the world, please take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples in your location. So thanks so much for joining us. This is the first ever Haskane Illuminate speaker series. Now the name Illuminate comes, it was born out of a few very illuminating with an I conversations that we've had with our most recent Haskane Alumni Award recipients, Eleanor Chu, Whitney Rockley, and Audra Stevenson. And trust me, you're really going to enjoy this group. They're a lot of fun to be with. We wanna give the opportunity to you, our Haskane community, to be part of this energy and to share in the wisdom and insight of our Haskane alumni family. So today's topic focuses on the generational perspectives of entrepreneurs. You'll hear from Eleanor, Whitney and Audra and how they have taken their ideas from pen to paper and navigated their way through systemic access, um, stereotypes and gender rules. These are three highly successful entrepreneurs. We're just so proud of them from the Haskine School. And more importantly, how we as a business community can support the next generation of entrepreneurs in our move towards equity and inclusion. Now, I hope you will enjoy hearing their stories and perspectives as much as I have every time I've been with them. Today's panel will be moderated by Jillian Luke. Jillian is in her final year of the MBA program and currently serves as the Vice President Academic and co-lead Women in Focus with the Haskane MBA Society. Jillian has a background in the live events and aviation industries and experience in project management, business process, and client relations. To complete her MBA, Jillian is taking a directed studies course in thought leadership, developing skills, in connecting interviews and facilitating strategic discussions by exploring neurodiversity and business, a perfect fit to lead today's discussion. So with that, over to you, Jillian, and the rest of us are going to enjoy some really great conversation. Jillian. Thank you so much, Jim. And good afternoon, everyone. As Jim mentioned, my name is Jillian Luke, and I'm happy to be your moderator for today's panel and to introduce each of our speakers. Eleanor Chu is a formidable woman, a business leader who leads with compassion, grace, and vision. Eleanor is the Chief Financial Officer of Trico Homes, Western Canada's first and only home builder to be certified as a B Corp. Alongside her husband, Wayne, Eleanor established their family foundation, the Trico Charitable Foundation. Through this organization, the Chus have invested in a number of high impact projects and initiatives that give back to the community and advance social entrepreneurship and enterprise in Calgary, including the Trico Foundation Social Enterprise Center at the Haskane School of Business. Whitney Rockley is a trailblazer in the venture capital community with over 20 years experience in private capital. Whitney has built a dynamic career focused on evolution, ideation, and strategic innovation. Whitney is the co-founder and managing partner of Microck Capital, a Toronto-based investment firm upending the industrial internet of things. With her team at Microck, Whitney finds unique ways to support entrepreneurs and innovators, exploring new avenues to diversify revenue streams, shaking up how things are done into the future of industrial innovation. Audra Stevenson combines her passions, business practice and theory, 
community advocacy, and innovative thinking, and applies these to her work with entrepreneurs, small business, and nonprofits. With a couple of her fellow Haskane grads, Audra founded Fresh Angles Inc., a boutique consulting company helping to diversify Calgary's entrepreneurial community and supporting small tech startups. Audra recently joined the Platform Calgary team, helping to bring Calgary's tech ecosystem together to help startups launch and grow. Welcome to our panelists. Now let's get started. So the first question I'm gonna to direct to Audra first, um, just to give you a chance to have an answer ready. Um, but I'm interested in knowing what the most significant factor or differentiator in your success as an entrepreneur has been, and also what success looks like or is to you. So Audra, maybe you can start with that. Oh, sure. Just a softball. Um, <laughs> um, I think um, for, for me, um, it's really been all about like really knowing myself. Um, I feel like I'm a very emotional person. Uh, I'm very like in touch with my emotions and trying to understand why I feel the way I feel about things. Um, I also trust kind of my gut and my instinct a lot. Um, and I think like asking those questions of like, why am I drawn to particular things? What does this say about my values? Is this project right for me? You know, would I be a good fit in a large organization or a small one? All of those questions kind of always come back to, to my values and really knowing myself and what I want out of my life, um, which is a good little segue into the second part of your question, um, which like, I think success has been like a real, a, a, a word that I've struggled with, oh, particularly over the last two years. I don't know if it's because I was turning 30 and so I was having like an existential crisis, but um, I think it's really a, a balance of like being ambitious and, um, and, and ambitious with purpose. Like uh, I wanna have that positive impact in my community, um, but also balancing that with being content in my life. Um, and I think oftentimes contentedness and ambition are very contradictory because ambition is wanting more and contentedness is being happy where you're at. And so it's kind of like that back and forth between those two things that I think would be success for me. For me, It's every morning I wake up and I'm at a different point with both. So yeah, maybe ask me tomorrow too. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And Whitney, what for you, would be the biggest factor and what is success yeah and i just i love audra like audra your, <laughs> your responses i'm like yeah yeah i i, I hear you right it, because it's a bit of a balance between contentment and ambition um and i'll get to that in a minute i i keep thinking um for the first question jillian that you had on you know what's the most significant factor you know or differentiator um, I kept going back to the children's book, Give a Mouse a Cookie, for those of the, you who actually know it. And it was funny because it was all interrelated. Um, and it starts with finding out a thing or a bunch of things that you really love. And, and when you find something that you really love, you become really curious. And when you become really curious, you become really, I call it relentless because you can't, you know, you just want to learn more and you want to take it in and it doesn't feel like work. Like it is, it's just friggin' fun, right? And then, and then it goes into the focus and the discipline to be a master at what you do. And so, so with, with, uh, with kind of the connectedness, that kind of, those are the three things that just really jumped out for me for the differentiators. And what is success to me? Um, Audra is enlightened because it's changed for me, and, you know, and I'm being really, really honest. Um, when I was, you know, graduating from my MBA at Haskane in 97, and I would have been about 26, 27 years old, success to me was without doubt um, career success. It was um, being able, it wasn't necessarily to be able to, to have extreme wealth. It was just to feel very successful in my career. And, and that took on different forms. And um, probably when I was in my 40s, I, I started to think more about balance 
And I was thinking, huh, if I could have done it over again, I might have changed a few things. This is why Audra's got a few things figured out. And then the, the, the kind of with where I am now in my 50s, it's really cool because I actually feel like I'm finding contentment and mastery and success and balance like it's all coming together but it takes a lot of work <laughs> to get there and and so it's kind of everyone's got their own path but but success has really changed for me over the decades so mm -hmm. that's that's Jillian kind of where I would go and Audra I know we can pick this up in lots of different fun ways <laughs> but that's how I would start it off yeah thank you so much for your honesty Whitney I think you have valid both of you have valid points and Eleanor do you want to add to that or go in a different direction? Well, it's really difficult to add to that because <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we, uh, we very much think alike and, and uh, everything they said is, is kind of resonate with me. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, being entrepreneurial, I'm very lucky because I, I'm not alone, you know, setting up a, uh, a business or a company. I have my husband with me. So there's a lot of time I have somebody to fall back on. Um, but as an entrepreneur, I think something you have to be very uh, determined or, or understand that uh, if you want to be a successful one, you have to be sure that you're a problem solver because nobody's going to be there 24 seven, pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I have this problem. Can you please help me? You pretty much have to come up with solutions uh, that it's the cheapest, it's the quickest, it's the most efficient because you want to save money, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you also have to be jack of all trade because I remember when I first joined my uh, husband's company, I was in charge of HR, IT, accounting, um, you name it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes if the kitchens or the it's dirty, the toilet is clogged, you know, we'll go there and get it fixed, right? And, and because, you know, you're small and you have very limited resources, you want to save all that for you know something that that you know that you need to deploy them on something right rather than hiring a plumber to come in and clean the kitchen or unplug the toilet one of the things that i i found uh you know uh, i really resonate with you know the balance that you're trying to find and you know the family and uh, making sure that you know you could look after as a woman especially look after everybody right because that's 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 pretty much how um, everybody's job as a family, parents, they all wanted to make sure the kids are uh, looked after and well looked after, but somehow the kids always want to go to the mommy and <laughs> uh, in most cases. But I, I think one of the biggest success I found is um, it's, you know, as an entrepreneur at certain stage, if you're able to control your own destiny, uh, you know, you have the resources, you have the wisdom, you have the experience and you have the networking and the support and friendship that that, you know, you, you could do whatever you want uh, in in certain you know, stages, you know, um, and and, you know, what what you want it to do at uh, at that stage is how you it's, it's your path. What's your passion? And you know how you wanted to impact the the world, the society, or, or as close as your children, right? Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, I think the freedom is that you really get an opportunity to to choose what you want to do and how you want to do it. You have the flexibility, but also, you know, it's a, it's it's not easy. It's a lot of hard work, but at the end of the day, you do have the flexibility. Yeah, Thank and you. hey, Jillian, can I jump in on this? Because I want to pick up on what Eleanor just said. There was there was a moment, um, you know, I was in my early 40s when I started McRock Capital. And um, I remember just being really tired and I'd always worked for somebody. Um, but I, you know, Audra and I and, and Eleanor, the three of us have had conversation about work-life balance, which is a really interesting one that we might want to bring up if we have time today. But in my generation, it was kind of, you know, you work, you're dedicated, you're committed to your profession, first and foremost, and you kind of work 24 seven. And when I started our firm, I remember feeling worried, because I wasn't sure I would have the energy to be able to do what I needed to do, because you know that when you're an entrepreneur, you're doing it all, and you've got to dig really, really deep. And one of the coolest takeaways that I had um, a few years into McRock was the energy 
was released in a place that was so deep inside of me that it had never been unlocked before because it wasn't my own. And the power of being an entrepreneur and the power of choosing your own course is, in my view, it, it's, it's one of the most kind of beautiful places to be. But I didn't have the opportunity to experience that until I was in my 40s. And Eleanor, I think you had started your business, you know, um, you know, you've been running this business for a very long time, right? Um, for about 20, well, Wayne started the, it's our, actually our company's 30 years anniversary. And I joined him uh, about 25 years ago when we started to have kids because I, I need the flex, flexibility mm -hmm. that I can just hop in and hop out, you know. And uh, well, at that time also his uh, accountant just gave two weeks notice during tax time. So I have no choice but, <laughs> <laughs> but to step in. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I meant by jack of all trade, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Whitney, I want to um, pick up on what you said about your generation and talk about how the era that you attend, attended Haskane and, and the things that you've experienced in life, how has that shaped you and, and how can other generations learn from that perspective? Yeah, you know, Haskane was a really important important time um, in my 20s, uh, kind of 25 to, to 27, and obviously still to this day. It was back in the 1990s, it was one of the very first programs where you could do a, a focus on entrepreneurship. And that's what I wanted to do. And so it gave me this phenomenal foundation of how to evaluate businesses, how to look at smaller businesses and medium sized businesses, you know, it was, it was just, it was really creative and it was, it was again a bit of a, of, a, of an unlocking of different ideas that I had. Um, I was also on the case team <laughs> and while if anybody's listening to this, everyone knows I really struggled with public speaking and I, I always felt so bad for my team members because uh, I did it as a way to challenge myself, but some days were really wobbly and other days were better, but my case, case years at, at Haskin really helped me figure out how to think a little bit faster on my, my feet mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and do things that were, you know, time pressured. So that was really good. So, you know, Haskin taught me a lot around, you know, being lean and agile and being really analytical and really hardworking. Because as we all know, when you're in these courses, mm -hmm. the volume is massive. Like, you know this, Julian, you're like, you're finishing your, your MBA right now. And isn't it ridiculous? Like, it's just kind of like, where do you pick and choose in order to do it? So you have to figure out how to prioritize, which is awesomely fun. And then um, the other thing Haskane had at, at the time that I was doing it was they had a mentorship program. Mm -hmm. And I was paired with this phenomenal mentor who really helped shape my career in the early years and even in the later years. Um, and, uh, and that made all the difference in the world. So yeah, Haskane was absolutely instrumental in my you know mid to late late 20s kind of getting me off if you will to a really good start awesome and Eleanor for you the same question um yeah it's uh I think when I was at Haskin it's not even called Haskin yet <laughs> <laughs> how you know how I dated myself <laughs> um it it's one of the things that really stands out um well, even today, is back then we had a lot of uh, teamwork, a lot of group projects, and um, it's really unusual for for school, you know, university in the eighties. I have you know group projects, and they, they, you're pretty much forced to work on every every courses has a group had a group, so you you have to have a team group project, and uh, that really taught me a lot because there's all you know all kinds of people, all kinds of work ethics, all kinds of um, knowledge, you know, when, when you're actually doing teamwork. And uh, at the end of the day, you have to hand in your, your uh, assignment or report, regardless of how many people actually participate or how, you know, how much each team members contribute. There's no such thing as fairness. All you want to do is to get it done and, and make sure the whole team get a good mark. So that, that is something that is really important for entrepreneurial because it, uh, Sometimes you can't expect everybody to put in the same efforts, but at the end of the day, your goal is to make sure you have a good result, right? 
-hmm. And the other thing um, that I'm really treasure, uh, what I learned at, uh, at that time is uh, a third year, you have to take uh, every, like well, at least one or two courses from every discipline. So you have accounting, finance, HR, uh, marketing, um, and that really helped me in knowing a little bit of everything. So when I need that, that uh, knowledge of being jack of all trades, at least I'm not starting from scratch. So that really um, helped, you know, uh, in kind of preparing me for, for when I was working uh, at Trico for my husband, mm -hmm. or with my husband, I guess. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And Aja, what, what would you say has been something that you can you know share with others in terms of what you've learned yeah I think um the the cohort that I was in was super super close um and it was really different backgrounds so like I came from theater there were people from kinesiology from the hotel industry it was it was actually I think like one of the lowest engineering years <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, no, no hate on engineers. They're equally creative, but uh, um, yeah. And, and we kind of were a bit of like a hippie cohort, I think in that um, we were really interested as a group um, around like, like what I would call like business for good. Like how do we create, you know, companies and how do we participate in companies in a way that makes the world around us better? Um, and I remember there was a big, we had a big backlash in one of our classes against, um, doing case studies on like the Googles and the, the Amazons and that sort of thing. And we were like, we want case studies on like the mom and pop shop on the corner that has a tight cash flow and let's solve that problem for them. Um, and so I think like being surrounded by that group of people for me, um, was really magical because it really encouraged kind of what, what might've been um, a flame that would have got extinguished in kind of maybe a more traditional, like very corporate focused mindset. Um, and so I think that was like, that was really fun um, being part of that group. Um, but I don't think that like, I don't think that's a generational thing. I think that's just like right place, right time. I think like, I'm sure that there's, there's that situation in a lot of different generations and it's just, um, you know, when you go out into the world, is that supported or kiboshed um, by the steps that you take going forward? And I think we just had a lot of people in our cohort who went and did their own thing, or, um, you know, maybe they went to work for Deloitte, but they have a side hustle, um, you know, things like that. So I think, um, yeah, Haskin was, was very, very magical for me. And I met a, a lot of my best friends there. So, um, yeah. A lot of appreciation and love for that community. I love that you're all using words like magical and 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 those kind of words because I think it it speaks to more than just learning. Absolutely. Oh, and, and Eleanor, the group work did not change. <laughs> it's the same. And there are still people who do no work and put their name on your paper. So <laughs> too bad there has to be alphabetical order, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you, for your reflections. And I, I want to move to kind of um, one of the things that Jim talked about. And, you know, as we all sit here as, as women, uh, something that I'm sure at some point we've had in common. And I want you to imagine if systems were equitable, equitable diverse, and inclusive for all people, and everyone sent, felt a sense of belonging. And I want you to to describe what it's like or how we got there or what, what is most important in that. And I think I'll start with Eleanor. You haven't started yet. So if you wanna give us some of your ideas and- The, the only thing I could think of was John Lennon's Imagine. <laughs> I think it would be a, I, I love music and, and that is a song that really resonates with me. And I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a utopia that we, we try and, you know, to look for a work towards. And, uh, you know, for, for my husband and I, like, you know, doing well by doing good and contributing back to the communities is really big for us, mainly because, uh, you know, you see the, um, 
injustice or, or imbalance of the, of the community or the society, um, you know, how are you gonna give people the opportunities that they deserve, uh, regardless of the gender, uh, the background, uh, that, that's very important uh, for us. Um, I don't know if we will actually see the, you know, the actual um, system that will be fully equitable or diverse, but I think working towards it and, and bringing that awareness to the bigger community, it's very important so that people are aware they're, you know, that um, there, there are issues, right, in, in the society and how do we handle and how do we actually help out with what we uh, the resources that we have, uh, whether it's financial, whether it's just our, you know, our, our talent and, um, you know, everybody could kind of chip in to help out. Um, if we even just have that thought uh, in ourselves, I think it will be a much better world for everyone, not just the, not just the, uh, uh, you know, the sort of the minorities group, but I think as a whole, the society will create so much more value for everybody. Thank you, thank you for that. I think that's one of the things the, that it would be better for everyone is one of the things that came out of my coursework this semester and that really resonates with me. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Whitney, do you, do you wanna share with us kind of where you're thinking on this? I'm, I'm very much aligned with where Eleanor is going. Um, you know, I, I have a world where I imagine that how we talk and what we look like is completely invisible. Like that, that is where I want to get to. I want to get to a place where people do not treat each other differently just because of how we look, what we wear, how we sound, you know. Um, and I, I've had the pleasure in my career where I've worked with individuals and I have felt that I've been, you know, invisible and it's been the skills and the perspective that I bring that is valued. And so when everyone listens to one another and they respect one another and you know the different perspectives and ideas where Eleanor was going is really key, but Eleanor touched on something that is so, so important. And she's talking about grassroots efforts just start doing your part. You know, there's this great story of the starfish. I think everybody knows the starfish story. I think we even spoke about it on one of our many webinars that, that we've had, but of the little girl on the beach and there's all the stranded starfish. Um, and she's picking one starfish up at a time and throwing it back into the ocean. And a man comes along and says, you silly girl, what are you doing? And she said, well, I made the difference to one starfish and I'll go keep going, you know, one starfish at a time, at a time, at a time. And so I think that there's a lot to be said over just trying to do your very best to um, do your part, to make sure that you are really valuing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, those three pillars are, are absolutely imperative. And the other thing I'll say, and Eleanor brought this up, and it's something that we can get into perhaps in the Q&A if, if some of the listeners are interested, but it's the power of the team. And when you build a really unique team that comes from lots of different backgrounds and has lots of different perspectives, you know, it's not comfortable, but it's not meant to be comfortable. <laughs> like You don't want it to be comfortable. If, you're, if it's comfortable, you're actually not pushing yourself hard enough to get these different perspectives up. And so I had, I had the pleasure of starting McRock with what I call my JBJ you know, because I'm a bit of a rocker from the 80s, but the John Bon Jovi bandmate, so my JBJ bandmate, and, and we know everything about each other, like we are best, best, best friends, and we have, we've assembled a band around us, and we've got Haas at Hearth and Uda on our team, they all have worked around the world, but there's five of us, and we got a band, and we friggin' rock it, like we rock it, and we're all really different, <laughs> Like different, but it works. And so that's what I think about when I think about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So thanks, Jillian, for, for giving us that question. It's an important one. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you, that you mentioned really almost like appreciating what people bring so that you can use that to power that team and that, that group. 
Yeah, I well, it, and I'll even share it. Sorry, and Audrey, I know you got to talk, so I'll shut up in a second, but I'll share a quick story with you. Like 10 years ago, we had to do this exercise. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch was looking at investing in us, and they asked us to go back in our track records from the beginning of our career and look at the diversity of the management teams and the overall teams that we had invested in, and then to overlay performance metrics. And it was so black and white. The teams that were the most diverse in the management and the broader teams outperformed every single time the teams that were not diverse. And so that actually is a driving underlying kind of foundational pillar that we have in our firm is that diversity drives performance. Interesting. I've read a lot about that as well. And I, I appreciate you providing you know, your own experience with that. So Audra, what, if you were to imagine this world, what would that look like to you? Um, so I'll, I'll agree with Whitney is like, get ready for discomfort. Um, I think like I, you see it all across society right now, the acknowledgement of privilege is like the very minute first step. Um, I think until everybody can go, yeah, actually, uh, the color of my skin has never been a barrier for me getting a job. Being white is maybe a reason that I did get a job um, until everybody can kind of get on board and acknowledge that. Like, I, I, I don't see us moving forward past that. Um, and I think like part of that, like really it's, I always think about it as a, like a shift in the default. Um, mm -hmm. So like right now, you know, I think, I think everybody does this in their, their, in some leadership course, everybody closes their eyes and you go imagine a CEO of a fortune 500 company and everybody imagines, you know, a guy named Kevin, um, which is, you know, whatever, but um, the, the problem is that Kevin is the default, you know, all things are built for Kevin. Um, and uh, I've often felt like I am often trying to fit into a world that wasn't built for me, wasn't meant for me, wasn't there for me to be successful. Um, and so I won't lie, I, I often want to just burn everything down and start fresh, but that's not realistic. Um, so I think like it, it is going, okay, I am a white woman. What lenses am I missing when I look at this issue? Um, I, I'm a big fan of smarty goals. So you set your smart goal and then you add inclusivity and equity into it. So, okay, I'm making a decision on an operational perspective, but is it creating barriers for people that I'm not thinking of because I don't automatically think of what it's like to be Eleanor, to be Asian, to be black, to be, you know, trans, to be bisexual. What, you know, what barriers am I creating by accident? because that's not the default lens that I live my life in. So I think to Whitney's point, the diverse team just means that you're bringing more lenses to the table automatically, which is great, but it's just really being intentional about incorporating that into every piece of your strategy as a company, into every interaction that you have in your life as a person. Um, and yeah, like choosing to lift others up based off your own privilege. So. Um, you know, I think historically white feminism has been a problem because it only takes the lens of white women and feminism, but how could we as white women lift up uh, women of color in a really intentional way, um, you know, make it so that they're at the forefront, they're the center, um, and they get to tell their stories. Those are, those are kind of like some of the pieces that I am trying to do <laughs> on a, on a daily basis. I, I don't know what it looks like when we get there because I, I genuinely think like the generation behind me um, is even more, you know, in it, like automatically thinking through all this stuff and that's their like state of being. And so I think every generation we're going to get closer and closer and um, they're going to push us. And I always just think like, what, what is the thing that when I, you know, when I, 30 years from now that I look back and I go, I was so wrong. I, I can't, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, it's probably closer. It's going to be five years, 10 years, whatever. But like looking back and going like, wow, I really was on the wrong side of that argument. Um, I'm excited to see what those things are coming forward. Cause I think it's just going to get us 1% closer and closer. Yeah. 
Absolutely, and I, I like your comment about closer to a state of being. Um, I noticed that, you know, my nieces and nephews and, and everyone that their reality is, is something that I felt like I've had to, to fight for or that, that, I, that wasn't a reality when I was younger. So I, that's really exciting. And thank, thank all of you for sharing. Um, on this note, um, we're gonna move to some of the questions uh, from the Q&A. And I wanna continue on with the gendered uh, question. So how have you or your support network navigated gendered roles on your entrepreneurial journey? And I don't know if anyone wants to try that. Eleanor, I know you mentioned family and, and your partner and, and all of that. So maybe you can start. Um, well, I, I have to say I, I'm very lucky because I have a lot of support and uh, from all over um, my husband and I have when my kids were younger uh, uh, I have three nannies <laughs> um, uh, well mainly because I also have my uh, other like my in-law were also living uh, with us but um, like at, as a woman uh, I'm a very traditional woman to me my kids and my family are my top priority uh, although, yes, at the same time, I, I want to, especially when I was younger, I want to prove myself that, you know, I, I could, I could do it, you know, um, but at the end of the day is you really have to prioritize uh, what's the most important for you. Um, kids grow up and you cannot turn back time, but you can always start a business, no matter what age you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are certain times that certain things that I put priority, like on top of everything. So, so what, what, what what is your uh, choice and you know what do you think is the most important for you everybody's different right mm -hmm. um so so it's it's a very personal choice and you really have to um you know think through it and make a commitment and making sure that you when you look back as what audra said you you not only that you're not on the wrong side but you have no regrets i think that that's very important and that definitely speaks to what Audra said, at, you know, in the very first question about knowing yourself and really prioritizing based on what you value. Um, Audra, do you want to share or add anything to that? Um, I would say don't unload the dishwasher. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is just this is just like such a random story, but it's always stuck in my brain of um, going into a new office and. Uh, like a, a co-working space and um, the woman doing the tour saying don't unload the dishwasher because um, she was like you're the one of the only women here it's people are gonna like expect it of you don't do it um, and it kind of just like I always repeat that to myself of like I think um, some, sometimes I struggle to know like what is actually my personality and what are things that I have been like societally programmed to like do and and find um, find value from or like give value in the way and I think unloading a dishwasher is a really like benign example of that of like well if I unload the dishwasher I'm a team player and I'm like you know doing all the right things to be agreeable and no one will be upset with me and and all these things but um, I'm not saying don't be a team player but I'm saying if you're the one who's always unloading the dishwasher because you're the only one who's thinking about unloading the dishwasher, put that emotional labor on someone else. Use a roulette thing to decide who <laughs> unloads the dishwasher, to, to decide who takes notes in the meeting, to decide who, like, because people will try and ignore that there's just these biases of like, oh, Audra will go get the coffee because she's the only woman in the room. Um, and it's not intentional and oftentimes it's very benign but just don't do it. Just make a system that doesn't allow for that bias. Um, and that's kind of how I get out of, you know, doing those things. I will say though, like I, I love planning parties. And so I am always the one to plan like an office party, which like is one of those kind of, I think, gendered roles that you end up in, but um, yeah, don't unload the dishwasher. Wait for someone else to do it. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's so it's so interesting listening to the the two of you and your different responses because it's a hard one. That's a really good question about how do you navigate this. You know, I um I always say you either have roots or wings as as a person, and I I grew wings, and so while I grew up mostly in Calgary. I took our family when our, our son was really young to San Francisco, and then I moved up to Edmonton, and then I moved over to London, to the UK, and then Switzerland, and then Toronto. And uh, I didn't have, uh, uh, you know, a, a broad support network. Um, I had just my core family. So it's kind of, you know, I relate with where Eleanor um, is, is talking. And I remember I had my job in Edmonton. And I showed up five months pregnant and it was with my second child. And so my body knew exactly what to do. So I, I was like, pop. And I walked in and my former boss who I worked with, she looked at me before I had started in this new job at a new company. And she said, oh my God, Whitney, like, have you told them? And I'm like, no, it's none of their goddamn business. I don't need to tell them. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm not the one who's at home raising the kids. And, and so this, I am fine. I can do this. And so I had a bit of a generational um, chip on my shoulder, which is I basically double dog dared anybody like take me on, challenge mm -hmm. me, call me an idiot, criticize me and watch me just put you in the ground because I will run circles around you in ways that, you know, you can't even imagine. So take that, right? Like, so I had this really deep seated um, view of, you know, sure, go ahead and test me, but I'm going to win because that's what I do. I win. And, and so, so it was, it was such an ingrained piece. And I have so many stories of how I had to navigate certain things that, you know, I look back on it now and I'm like, oh, I just hope it's, I hope it's easier, you know, for others to, to go through that. But, um, but what I learned um, probably about 15 years ago was that you just had to surround yourself with people who really, if I can use this kind of cliche word, but are really your people, the people who challenge you and support you and love you no matter what. And it doesn't need to be 20 people. It can be three people. It can be two people. It can be one person, but you need, you need that really core group that when you need something, when you need that hug, when you need to show a little bit of your underbelly, because you know, you're having a tough time. You got to be able to expose that in a way that, that, you know, you can still roll back over and, you know, you're not going to get kicked in the head for doing it. So, so those, though, that's it, that network and, and that core support group is really critical. Can I just add something? Um, I, I think a lot of us, uh, usually like, you know, the first time when I was in a boardroom, you know, as a board member, it was like, um, you know, you, you're scared and you're trying to kind of act certain ways to make sure that, that you accept it and things like that. But um, just remember, they 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 wanted you to be in the job or in the board, or or it's because of you. It's not because of your gender. It's not because of you know your your ethnicity. So just be yourself, and you don't have to act like somebody that you're not. So just um, you know, uh, be comfortable and confidence in yourself. Confidence is everything because if you walk into a boardroom and you don't believe in yourself, nobody's going to. Yeah, and Eleanor, this is a tough one, right? The whole confidence one is one that I've struggled with because I picture I picture kind of a scale where you've got kind of courage, which is kind of around the confidence, you know, that outward confidence, and you've got fear. And and I actually think in a lot of ways, fear drives us to perform. Um, and and you've got to figure out that balance of how do you how do you how do you just own yourself and who you are so you can you can show up in a really authentically you sort of way that's what you're getting at and and I think it just takes a lot of um digging deep and a lot of experience and just you know you you find that and you just go with it right but it is it's it's a hard one because I've always struggled with the fear and the confidence and then the courage I kind of see them in in those dynamics I think it's like a it's it's such a um, like a like a cyclical thing because I think where where my confidence often comes from and when I feel that fear I'm trying at least now in my life to to turn towards like vulnerability and transparency in that and so like being honest about like 
I am scared. I am freaked out by this. I don't feel comfortable. And there's like power and confidence in admitting that you don't feel powerful and confident. Um, so it's, it's kind of like cyclical in that way. I love that. I love what you just said, because you're acknowledging it, right? And so you're not, you're not trying to ignore it. And I remember years ago when I, when I was working in San Francisco, there was one of the guys I worked with, his name was Dave, Dave Dreesen. And he was a basketball player and he was part of the investment team. And he, I just so looked up to Dave. He was just so friggin' smart and, and an engineer, Audra. And, uh, <laughs> and Dave, Dave, Dave and I were talking and he's like, let the fear drive you let the fear drive you, you know, acknowledge it and let it drive you. And I always say, I actually say to so many people, you know, younger people that um, sometimes when you're fearful, it's because you genuinely care, right? When you're nervous, when you're talking really fast, that's because you care. I actually want to see that. Like, I, I want to see those, you know, people really loving so much of what they, like the moment that they're in, that they're freaking themselves out because it means that they're probably really caring about that moment. And, and that's genuine, right? That's so authentic. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's like, if there, if there's anything like that I feel is coming down the pipeline, like especially based off of the pandemic, it's really that corporations are under pressure to let their employees be humans, you know, and like, and admit that they're scared and admit that they are, you know, maybe don't feel like they're good at their jobs sometimes and, and all of these pieces. Um, and I think that there's a real kind of panic around that of like oh no like our employees are human beings it's scary but like the like I would love I would have loved when I was younger and, and not working for my myself to have a a, a boss or a, a manager who like showed that they weren't confident all the time mm -hmm. and like told me what they were freaked out by and let me be a person within that kind of more professionalism sphere in, you know, one of the things we did, we tried it as a bit of an experiment that we actually brought in a vulnerability coach um, and we did a whole team session around vulnerability. Um, but one of the things that we were really aware of is that as the, you know, the leader of, of the firm, I actually started with, with it so people could follow. And it was fascinating. And, you know, our team members, you know, if they can embrace vulnerability, because it's one of the hardest things to do. Um, you really can, you can really get to the next level and the next level and the next level. But that vulnerability training is, is really critical. There was, there was, sorry, and Jillian, I hope you don't mind if I do this, but there was another question that kind of feeds into this. And I think it was from Susan, but she asked the question about what we could do around hiring and recruiting mm -hmm. and um, a couple of thoughts that I'll just throw out there too, because I find them uh, again, pretty grassroots, but they've worked wonders for us. Um, when you're coming up with your job spec, there's this great site, it's free, and it's called Gender Decoder. So you can actually put in your job spec and you put it into the Gender Decoder site and it'll actually tell you which words are more neutral. So you're not doing just masculine words or perhaps just feminine words. So that's one thing we've used. The other thing is there is this great software company in Kitchener-Waterloo that's um, headed up by Caitlin McGregor called Plum. Plum HR, Plum Like the Fruit. And we've used this for about seven years, but what it does is it really helps you reduce your unconscious bias when you are recruiting. Um, and it matches your personality, your innate personality and who you are with the job spec that you're hiring for. And it gives you a score on how well that candidate fits. So we actually do that as our first step. And then we actually do, we use a one-way video uh, uh, service called uh, Spark Hire, because if I'm talking to Audra, I might ask Audra 10 totally different questions that if I'm talking to Eleanor or Jillian. And so it makes people, it keeps you on par with the same questions for those, for those candidates. And, and it's just a one way. Uh, so they can do it 
in the luxury of their own home and it's you know when they're the freshest and and they can do retakes of questions if if you permit it and then the uh, the third thing we do is we do anonymous case studies. So our CFO, she will um, anonymize the names and just put numbers beside it. So we're actually looking at the strength of the submission rather than the individual. Now, you, humanly, it's funny, our team will naturally start guessing, oh, we think that's so-and-so or we think that's so-and-so, you know, because you've kind of got your top candidates. That's human nature. But it's just ways that you can try and reduce your bias um, when, when you're hiring. So hopefully that's helpful for Susan. Okay also um, may help with candidates who aren't necessarily great at interviewing because that is not a strength that everyone has. Eleanor, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I think during the, uh, you know, being an immigrant and minority and English is not my first language, um, good excuse. <laughs> um, I, I think being patient and let the candidate to express themselves uh, slowly and clearly, uh, because a lot of time when you walk into an interview, you're so nervous and so scared already. So one of the, 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 the biggest thing is if you could have some ways to calm your candidates down and making sure that he or she has the opportunity to actually tell you, uh, tell you everything that they, they want to tell you, you know, how great they are and things like that, and especially for, for people where, you know, English or French is not the, the first language. It might take a little while for them to warm up and, and just be patient and, and um, trying to listen to uh, what they have to say, because sometimes also even the expressions uh, will be different, right? From from you know, because you know, if it's not your first language, you're translating in your head and trying to present it in English, and and that 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 makes a huge difference. Um, and usually, these interview I found like for myself, it'll be a little bit longer than what you expect because it takes them a little bit uh, longer to feel comfortable and co feel comfortable to express themselves in 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 English. Um, and um, yeah, so. At the end of the day, I think um, we, we just like uh, Whitney's, um, we did a lot of uh, profiling and, uh, you know, different tools that, that you, could, you could actually um, use. But sometimes having a face-to-face -face conversation where you can look at the person's uh, body language, um, you know, that really helped to understand that person a little bit better and see if it's a, it's a, it's a good job fit. You know, um, to me, as always, it's a good fit, whether it's a minority or white, um, it doesn't matter. It's the person that best fit the job that you should be hiring. Thank you. I wanna maybe move on to one more question while we have a, bit, a few moments. The question is, how have you created opportunities to work abroad slash internationally? Any tips on what to do when in mid-career and you don't want to start at the bottom again? And I mean, I moved six months before I started my MBA, I moved from Toronto and had to start all over again. So I'm curious on your tips about this as well. Yeah. So I've, I've, got, a, I've got a couple of comments. One is um, you don't always have to start at the bottom. So be really discerning. And Jillian, I would challenge your perspective and say, so you left Toronto and you went to Calgary and you're doing your MBA and you started all over again. But think about how much richer you are in experience in the two years that you've had. And so in a lot of the roles that I've had, uh, and I have moved and lived in lots of cities and countries now, um, some of them were lateral moves. Some of them, and many of them were promotional moves. Uh, and I, it's cliche, but I live by it and it's just do it, just do it. Like I remember when I moved to the UK and I'm, I'm a British Canadian citizen, so I've got dual citizenship and it was so freaking cool. I knew how to do the job blindfolded and I wasn't going there just because I wanted to do necessarily that job because it was going to take my skill set to the next level. I was doing it because I wanted that experience of living in the UK. I thought that would be so cool. So, so think really discerningly about, you know, well, why are you doing it? And, and you don't have to take the job abroad if you feel like you're starting over and that's not what you want to do. Um, another opportunity will come along. The other thing that I'm going to say a thousand times over, because I didn't, I didn't realize it until I was about 35, was the power of working with people that you really respect and knew because you'd already had you know, a good decade 
of working with a bunch of people. And so you knew which one, which people in your, you know, kind of your circles you really liked and you really worked well with. And I, I hit a place where I, I guess I was fortunate enough where I got to choose who I wanted to work with. And when job offers came in, if I didn't feel like I knew the team well enough, the core senior team, I didn't take it because I didn't want to. I didn't want to have that risk of being with people that perhaps wouldn't have the same values that I had when I worked. Thank you. I think doing, doing background check is also very important. So if you're moving overseas, make sure you know the culture of the country or the, even the city where you're moving to so that you know what you're expecting and what people are expecting of you. And um, same, like if you're moving job from one company to another, make sure you do a, a deep dive into who this company is and who in terms of, you know, the personality, the culture and everything, it's not what, right? Um, that, that's very important because, you know, you, you really want to have a good fit for yourself and otherwise it won't be a, 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 good, a, a good match. Yeah. And the other thing that people need to do is do not be afraid to ask for references on your future bosses they reference check the crap out of you. So feel strong enough to say, give me three people that you worked with that were your peers and direct reports. It's fascinating the information you can get by, by that. Um, so that, that's something that I've consistently done as well before I've accepted offers. Audra, any last comments? I'm a Calgary gal, so. <laughs> But sounds like great advice. I would listen to both Ele Eleanor and Whitney. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So um, I just wanna say thank you to all three of you and for everyone who has, has joined us today. Uh, there's so many things to take away from this conversation, uh, but I think really knowing yourself and having a good support group around you and, and living with purpose is, some of the biggest things that I can take away from this. And I think not being afraid to acknowledge what you need and, and you know, where you wanna go will be something that is really going to help me and, and hopefully help everyone else who's listening. So thank you all three of you again. And with this, I'm gonna turn it back to Jim who's gonna give some final closing remarks. Well, you know what, honestly, I have to say, I still have one question and uh, it's a pretty simple question, why? Why does this have to end? I've so enjoyed every minute of this. I mean, the three of you, uh, so much wisdom, um, really great advice. You're all so brave. I would never double dog dare you, Whitney, or either of the other two, I probably would be put in the ground. But uh, really very honest, uh, very high quality and very sincere comments and uh, a lot of magic. I really like that Jillian had that, that comment right off the bat. There's a lot of magic within this group and we're just so amazingly proud that you are Haskin alum. And uh, I think you also um, emphasize the spirit that uh, I, I really try to get across to our students that it's a two way street you're going to get as much out of your degree as you put into it. And uh, each of you talked about that, you know, the importance of, uh, of, of putting yourself out there and um, getting close. Uh, you know, Audra, you were talking about your cohort, which I know they are a bunch of hippies or really cool people. And, uh, but you have to be a part of it to really get the experience and to build towards your future. So thank you so much for your honest, sincere, and really spellbounding uh, conversation today. We're, we're just so fortunate to have you. Jillian, uh, thank you so much for a fantastic job and moderating the discussion. I can't wait to celebrate you and your fellow graduates when you cross the stage in June, which uh, we're looking to have a live convocation again. Yay. Uh, before we sign off today, I want to let people know that uh, if you haven't been by the university, we're building a new building. It's really fabulous. It's up, it uh, looks beautiful. It'll open in October. And we're trying to, um, we still need a little bit of money to close this off. And so we're running a campaign. It's called the Matheson Hall Brick by Brick Campaign. With a gift of just $2,500, your name will be added to a commemorative 
installation on a brick wall in the atrium of Matheson Hall. And not only that, uh, we have a variety of ways that you can give the 2,500, including as low as $100 a month for 25 months. Come on, anybody can afford that. So we need to have everybody on this call, all of your friends, anybody you know from Haskane to, uh, you can just Google brick by brick Matheson Hall. And uh, well, there's the link was just provided. And let's get everybody uh, in on this. Not only that, if you make your gift on April 21st, which is just a couple of days from now, your donation will be matched dollar for dollar up to another 2,500 while matching funds last. So um, there you've seen the, uh, the link. Please go to it, send it to everybody you know. Let's close off this building with a bang and get a whole bunch of names on the wall. That would be great. Please don't forget to join us on April 28th, which is our next Haskane Hour. And the topic, are platforms dominating society? Do we all use Amazon? Are we listening to Otter and we'd rather do the corner street, uh, corner shop? I'm, I'm with her, but keep an eye on your email for registration details. Lastly, I just want to thank all of the participants for spending the last hour with us. Um, by the quality of questions that came out, I know that a lot of people got a lot out of it. Stay connected with us, stay involved with your school. And thanks again to everyone. Have a great afternoon and uh, stay warm. Bye.